Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Rosen, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We've muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the question and answer window on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question and answer portion, and I will ask our speakers your questions. Your questions in the question and answer window will only be visible to myself and our speakers. Before we get started, we do have one question for you that will help our speakers. So you're going to see that on your screen, and if you could just use your mouse to go ahead and select the answer that works best for you. The question is, do you currently monitor the elemental composition of your cell culture media? Um, yes, I use ICP-MS. Yes, I use ICP-OES. Yes, I use a technique other than ICP-MS or ICP-OES, or no, I don't monitor. So again, if you can just go ahead and take your mouse and select the answer that best works for you, that will help our speakers. i give you just a couple more minutes, or seconds, I guess. <laughs> okay. So, thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Robert Thomas from Scientific Solutions. Okay, good day, everyone. First of all, I want to thank Kirk and Alma for inviting me to contribute to this webinar. Even though I'm an independent educational consultant working in the field of trace element analysis, I've had an excellent working relationship with them for over 20 years. My talk today will be focused on the use of ICPMS for monitoring metals in cell culture media, and in particular, the benefits of a novel multi-quadrupole ICPMS system for this analysis. So let me dive straight in by giving you an overview of my presentation. First, I'll give a brief discussion as to why there is a need to monitor elements in cell culture media. Then I'll talk about the benefits of ICPMS for this application. Next, I'll give a condensed historical timeline of the development and performance improvements of the technique, including the analytical challenges of ICPMS or metal-rich sample matrices. Then I'll make a comparison between conventional single quadruple ICPMS instrumentation and a triple or multi-quadrupole technology for the reduction of plasma-based interferences using Perkin-Elma technology as an example. And I'll end with a real-world example of measuring a group of metals in cell culture media samples. It is well recognized that variability in cell culture media in the processing of biologics can lead to quality control failures and a reduction in yield. With metal ions having an important role as enzyme cofactors, their variation can influence the growth of cultured cells. The concentration of metals can range from low parts per billion up to tens of parts per million. For example, sodium, potassium, and calcium can maintain pH and regulate membrane potential, while copper, manganese, zinc, and iron all have a significant influence over the production of biologics and trace impurities have all shown to negatively affect the efficiency of culture media. Since this wide range of metal concentrations has a direct impact on cell growth, yield, and quality, their measurement and control is essential. But what technique is suitable for this analysis? ICPMS is the most logical approach because it is a rapid multi-element technique which is capable of measuring most of the periodic table. The next speaker will give an overview of the basic principles of the technique, but in general terms, it offers a very low detection capability for most elements, as shown by this color-coded periodic table. Over half the elements have detection limits around 1 ppt or less, shown in blue. The majority of the rest are less than 10 ppt, shown in yellow, while a few are around 100 ppt, shown in orange, purple, and green. It also offers up to nine to 10 orders of linear dynamic range, allowing quantitation from PPT up to high PPM levels. 
It's also very fast and can determine 20 to 30 elements in a few minutes. It is therefore ideally suited to monitor a wide and diverse range of elements in cell culture media. So let's take a brief look at the historical development of the technique with regard to performance enhancements. This graphic shows that over the past 38 years, there have been significant improvements in sensitivity, detection capability, and interference reduction. For example, in 1983, when ICPMS was first commercialized, sensitivity for one part per billion of indium was around 100 counts per second. Today, it is over 1 million counts per second. In addition, the background levels have been lowered from about 30 counts per second to less than one count per second. And with the development of collision and reaction cell technology in 1999, the reduction of polyatomic and molecular spectral interferences has been significantly enhanced. To put the instrument size in perspective, let's compare the oldest and latest instruments in the last slide. I worked on the Alan 250, which was the very first commercially available ICPMS system introduced at the 1983 Pittsburgh Conference in Atlantic City. This was developed by SIAX, a Canadian company, which Perk and Elmer formed a joint venture with in 1984. This slide shows the Alan 250 and the Perk and Elmer ne Nexion 5000 next to it, which would have fitted on the bench next to the instrument. What isn't obvious by this photograph is that the RF generator of the Alan 250 is six feet tall and is standing on the floor behind the table. So let's talk about ICPMS interferences, particularly when analyzing complex matrices like cell culture media. To get a flavor of spectral interferences in ICPMS, this is a mass spectrum from 40 to 80 atomic mass units, which exemplifies typical interferences that occur, which are mainly comprised of polyatomic molecular ions such as argon, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, chlorine, and sulfur, which are derived from a combination of ions generated by the plasma gas, the matrix components, water, other solvents, mineral acids, and entrained air, which are particularly severe in this region of the ICP mass spectrum. Also, if there are high concentration of metal ions in the matrix, they can generate additional interfering ions that can negatively impact the quantitation of trace elements in the sample. In addition, there are matrix suppression effects when analyzing culture media due to the high concentration of salts, which can change the ionization conditions in the plasma and impact the focusing of the ions through the mass spectrometer. So how can we mitigate or reduce these interferences? To better answer that question, let's take a look at the difference between a single quadruple ICPMS and a multi-quadruple system using Perkinelma technology as an example. Here are the principles of mass separation with the Nexion 1000-2000 single quadrupole system. The ion beam emerges from the plasma and enters the mass spectrometer via the interface cones into the quadrupole ion deflector, represented by Q0, which is an electrostatic analyzer that provides mass separation based on ion energy. It bends the ion beam 90 degrees, which acts as a filter before Q1 and ensures the complete removal of neutral species and photons without altering ion energy distribution. Q1 is the quadrupole universal cell, which is an active reaction collision cell with dynamic bandpass tuning using frequency modulation to stop the formation of interfering ions with a reaction or, or a collision gas using ion molecule chemistry. I'll talk more about that in the next slide. Then finally, Q2 is the analyzer quadrupole, which is used for unit mass separation, or better, of ions exiting the universal cell. So let's expand on how interference is created in the plasma are reduced with an active collision reaction cell. There are three primary modes of operation. Standard mode with no gas, which is used for routine samples with very few interferences. Second is simple collision mode, typically used in helium gas and kinetic energy discrimination, or KED, for moderate levels of interference reduction. And finally, there's dynamic reaction mode, where a reactive gas is used to chemically react with the interfering ion 
to either move it to another mass region or shift the mass of the analyte away from the interference using iron molecule reaction chemistry. It is known as an active collision reaction cell because a bandpass can be selected to stop the formation of interfering ions as opposed to a passive cell using higher order multipoles such as hexapoles or octopoles that just act as a simple ion guide allowing all ions through to the quadrupole analyzer. So let's compare the Nexium 1000, 2000 with the Nexium 5000 multi-quad technology shown here. The primary difference is the addition of Q1, which is a full analytical quadrupole. As in the single quad system, the ion beam emerges from the plasma and enters the mass spectrometer via the interface cones into the quadrupole ion deflector. Q1 is the first transmission analyzer quadrupole, which is used for unit mass separation or better of all precursor ions in the ion beam. Q2 is the quadrupole universal cell, which is a reaction collision cell with dynamic bandpass tuning capabilities using frequency modulation. This cell makes gas phase reactions more predictable and provides an additional stage of mass separation to maximize specificity of these reactions. And Q3 is the second transmission analyzer quadrupole, which is used for unit mass separation of ions exiting the universal cell. An important point to emphasize is that the Q2 quadrupole serves as an active reaction collision cell with well-defined stability boundaries, which means that unlike passive higher order multipole collision reaction cell, a bandpass can be selected to reject any additional interferences formed by secondary ion molecule interactions between the matrix, the solvent and argon ions and the reaction gas or any impurities in the reaction gas. So let's talk more about how a multi-quad system can be used to mitigate polyatomic and molecular interferences formed in the plasma. There are basically two ways of doing this. The first approach is to use the interfering ions away from the analyte ion using MS-MS mode. Under reactive conditions, sequential reaction chemistry is to be expected with the production of intermediate product ions of various masses, which have the potential to interfere at the mass of another analyte ion. In the example shown here, when trying to determine vanadium at mass 51 in the presence of chloride, Q1 will remove all other ions which are not at 51 AMU. The remaining ions are vanadium and the interfering species CLO. The CLO is removed by reacting with ammonia by a process called charge transfer. However, through a, sequence, through a sequence of further chemical reactions, intermediate ions could be produced that again interfere at mass 51. So using a passive higher order multiple cell, all these reaction byproducts will be, will be retained within the cell. However, with a quadrupole based cell, if one of the intermediate ions or reaction byproducts has a mass which falls outside the stability boundary, it will be ejected from the cell and further reactions will be suppressed. This is exemplified by the ammonia and chloride cluster ions at mass 51, shown here at the bottom of the slide in red, which have been prevented from forming by setting a mass cut of bandpass or RPQ setting. Also important to point out that another source of unwanted ions is due to the impurities in the reaction gas. Even with the purest gas, it is possible that trace levels of organic impurities will be present in the cell. Having a quadrupole inside the reaction cell will allow for the ejection of any intermediate ions due to these kinds of interferences. The second approach is by moving the analyte mass away from the interfering ions using mass shift mode. In this example, we show the determination of titanium in cell culture media, which has significant amounts of sulfur, phosphorus, and calcium, which can interfere with trace levels of titanium. By using mass shift mode with dynamic bandpass tuning, we can form a complex titanium cluster ion with ammonia gas and use it for quantitation. So how is this done? We know the primary titanium isotope is at mass 48. However, interfering ions from sulfur, phosphorus, and calcium at mass 48 are also formed in the plasma and can create direct spectral interferences on titanium. Therefore, ions that are not at mass 48 are rejected by the Q1 and will not reach the collision reaction cell. 
So in this example, titanium ions, sulfur and phosphorus molecular ions, and calcium ions, all at mass 48, enter the cell. Ammonia gas reacts rapidly with titanium, creating several titanium ammonium molecular cluster ions at higher masses. Q3 then resolves these cluster ions from the other masses. So in the mass spectrum shown here, the titanium ammonium molecular ion clusters produce a number of spectral peaks, including major ones at masses 115 and 132 AMU, which can then be used for quantitation. So let's take a look at a real example using these interference reduction techniques. In an effort to understand what elements have the largest impact on the yield of biologics, it is possible to develop a more robust analytical method using multiple modes for better specificity and more confidence in the data. As an example, this table is showing multiple results in part per billion for cobalt and nickel in three different sample types. Cobalt is run in three different modes, collision mode with KED, mass shift mode with mass shift mode and MS, MS mode, which are shown here in blue. Within experimental error, it can be seen that the results for each sample are very similar. On the other hand, nickel is running collision mode and mass shift mode, and also shows similar results for the three samples represented here in red. With these two elements, we can see agreement between the modes, which provides greater confidence in the accuracy of the data. Hopefully in my limited amount of time, I've given you a flavor of the potential of multi-quadrupole based ICPMS to carry out this very challenging analysis. If you're interested in learning more, you should check out this recent application note from Perk and Elmer. And if you're interested in learning more about the fundamental principles and other applications of ICPMS, I'll end my talk with images of three of my books, the most recent one, which was published earlier this year on measuring heavy metal contaminants in cannabis and hemp. With that, I thank you for your time and I'll hand you back to the moderator. Thank you, Robert. So the next speakers, we would like to welcome Dr. Adil Mohammed and Dr. Chikasar Madavaro from the US FDA. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, PKI Inter uh, International and Perkin Elmer for organizing this uh, you know, seminar and webinar. And thank you, Robert, for the nice introduction. So uh, the topic of my talk is practical approaches to metal analysis of cell culture media and impact on therapeutic protein production using ICPMS. So this is just a disclaimer that whatever I'm presenting right now is just our research and views of our author and it doesn't represent FDA views or policies. And also usage of any instrument from any vendor does not mean that we are endorsing any particular vendor or manufacturer. So I want to begin with uh, talking about pharmaceutical quality because in FDA, uh, my office is Office of Pharmaceutical Quality in Center for Drugs. So uh, obviously um, anything we, we purchase as a user, for example, if we buy a computer or a car or a cell phone, we expect that to work at a particular, in a particular fashion, you know, quality wise, it sh should meet to our expectations. And obviously, because we are dealing with drugs, so they're not different. And also, these drugs are even more important because uh, we as a consumer take it in our body and it's about life and death. So obviously, the pharmaceutical quality is even more important. And patients, we as a patient, as an end user, we expect safe and effective medicine with every dose we take. So that is why pharmaceutical quality in FDA uh, means that we assure that every dose which is taken by consumers is safe and effective and free of any contamination and defects. So as you all know that FDA always approved drugs, but our role as a regulatory agency doesn't end over there. Our goal is consistent monitoring even after approval. And that is what FDA does. One, one, one aspect of FDA is that to consistently consistently monitor the quality of the drug even after approval and also what we do research in our OPQ in DPQR which is our division is we deal with the quality issues you know for a, a classical example I can give everybody is you know in 2017 in the in fall we all start hearing in news about nitrosamine NDMA impurities in 
Velsartan and other drugs, which expanded to other drugs like metformin and other things. So that is one classic example that, you know, not, not only after approval, we keep monitoring and we, and we are always proactive and keep looking for things, you know, happening. And now you must be wondering that, uh, what are we talking about over here, metals in bioreactor? So another aspect of research at FDA is that we also do some research and homework for FDA if there is some gap, you know, between academia and industry and uh, FDA. So this is another classic example. So what we are studying in FDA is the aspect of metal impurities or metal, what is the role of these metals in bioreactors? So that is uh, one part of another aspect of our research, which ties to the pharmaceutical quality eventually. So this is the brie, so that is, and uh, this quality is give uh, the patient confidence and then in every dose we take, which makes it, you know, uh, obviously more assuring and relieving to consumers. So with this, this is the outline of, my, of our talk, me and Dr. Madhav Rao. So I will introduce the technique. I know Robert talked about in detail about the, the mass spec of the ICP. So I'll go over quickly and then I'll talk about the prep fast, which is our uh, auto dilution operators. And then I'll, and then uh, Dr. Madhav Rao will take over and, and then he'll talk about, you know, what detailed research we did on the impact of metals in bioreactor and on the production of the quality of the proteins we studied. So with this, I will briefly into talk about ICPMS. So ICPMS stands for inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. So basically it is two, in two parts, ICP and MS. So we have an ICP, which is the torch, and we have the mass spec connected to it. So the ICP, which is the plasma torch, is the source of energy. So you can imagine that to to monitor the ions, we have to convert them into the atomic state. So to con for the conversion from the aqueous state to atomic state, we need a lot of energy. So that energy we can have in form of either uh, flame, which is atomic absorption, or we can have graphite furnace, or we can have ICP. So uh, I'll just briefly talk about the ICP torch, which is shown over here on the, on the bottom left. So it consists of a quartz torch and is surrounded by the induction coils as shown in red. So what happens is uh, when argon comes in, which is the source of uh, plasma, because uh, and we initiate the plasma by an electric spark. So what happens is at that electric spark, we form argon plus and ions, cations. So this argon plus and these cations, they because of the of these fluctuating magnetic and electric field around the torch they collide with each other and with other ions and it, they keep generating more and more ions and they keep colliding these ions with each other in this fluctuating magnetic and electric field. And, and as a result, it generates this very uh, steady state plasma, which is like a gas-like phase of matter. Actually, it's like called like a fourth phase of matter now and with this high charge concentration of particles and it is very, very hot. So the temperature is around 6,000 to 10,000 Kelvin, which is equivalent to the temperature of the sun. So you can imagine it's very hot. So when this ICP is connected to the mass spectrometer, then we make this ICP MS. And I think Robert already, already talked about a lot in detail about the mass spectrometer. I'm not gonna talk about that. So on the bottom right, you can see how the plasma looks like when it is torched, when it is lit up on the instrument. For example, this one is on an ICP. And obviously uh, we have the safety you know, for the instrument, so it is already, you know, super cooled, you know, so nothing happens, but it is just very hot from inside the plasma. So uh, I think Robert went over this quick, I'm gonna go this quickly. So the the reduction limits for the different techniques, as you can see, the ICPMS is the most sensitive among all the techniques for atomic spectroscopy, like flame, graphite furnace. As, as you can see, the atomic absorption is around PPM range, and as we move to ICP uh, and graphite furnace and ICPMS, ICPMS, as you can see, is the most sensitive, mostly in parts per trillion range all across the PR table. And another advantage, as you can see, the graphite furnace is also in parts per trillion range, but the advantage of ICPMS is it is a simultaneous technique, which means that we can do multiple elements at the same time. Compared to graphite furnace or flame absorption, in which you can do only one element at a time. 
So that is another advantage. It is very, very rapid and very, very sensitive. And as you can see, we can just pick up any element across the periodic table, and that can be easily done by ICPMS at a very sensitive level. So how does this uh, sensitivity help us? So what are the advantages of ICPMS? So as I mentioned, because it's extremely sensitive, at least 1,000 times more sensitive than atomic absorption, so what that gives us, it supports large dilution factors. So that is very helpful because sometimes if you have very less amount of sample, for example, 0.5 ml only of your unknown sample, I, you cannot do atomic absorption on that because we need at least 2 ml for atomic absorption. So because ICPMS is very sensitive, we have to dilute depending on the on the on the on the metal like 100x or 10x. So again, so that is why we can easily do um, uh, using ICPMS. And also we need a less amount of sample. Even in uh, to inject, it needs a less amount of sample in ICPMS. And obviously because it is a mass spec, so we can also have some isotopic information. So that also helps sometimes depending on the application uh, by the ratio of the isotope will give you some more information what's going on. And last but not the least, the speciation, which is you can separate, you know, the free free metal from the metal bound to the ligand on an HPLC or UPLC, and then you can inject those separated species on ICPMS to quantify, which also gives us a, a better idea, for example, if you have a free drug or a drug bound to a metal, so that gives you some idea what's going on with the drug. So let me introduce now the smart auto dilution apparatus, which is called PrepFast. It has been manufactured by Elemental Scientific, which is a company, ESI, company in Nebraska. So it is a syringe-driven inline dilution apparatus as shown on the slide here. So as you can see, uh, and on the extreme right is the figure, you know, how it is. So you, at the bottom, you have your a rinse solution and your diluent and you have the syringes and then the top rack is where you put your samples and your standards. So obviously I've been using it for the past five years. So it is very, very reliable and almost n not much to maintain. And then we can use the organics or acid and it is very accurate and precise. So this is how exactly it is interfaced with our Perkin Elmer and Exion 300D, which we have in our lab. So as you can see, as we have the PrepFast on the right and then the ICPMS on the left uh, top. So as you can see, the PrepFast, it has the diluent and the carrier bottles at the bottom, and you can also have an internal standard. So this is an advantage of PrepFast that you can you don't have to add any internal standard manually to the sample. So basically, the PrepFast is adding all sa at the same time simultaneously all throughout your analysis. So your diluent and carrier and internal standard, it is taken up by the syringe and it goes to the loop, first loop called P7 plus here. And your sample from the sample rack also is taken up by the auto sampler into the first loop where it is diluted and by the diluent and internal standard is added. And then it goes to the loop P6. After dilution, it goes to loop P6. And then from P6, it is injected into the plasma on the instrument. And when it's injecting the loop from P, uh, the sample from the loop P6, the P7 is getting cleaned up, washed out with the carrier, getting ready for the next injection. So you can imagine, you know, it's getting ready for a second injection. And then after it injects the sample from the loop P6, then it cleans out the loop P6 for the next injection. So as you can see, simultaneously it is watching and cleaning and getting ready for the next injection. And then, you know, for the second loop, it is injecting. So there is a very less probability of carryover, and it is very, very accurate. And I'm, I'm going to show you an example of that. So this is the curve I generated for calcium, for example, as shown over here. So ranging from 10 ppb to 500 ppb. So the only thing I have to do for the, to generate this, and I have six points on the on the calibration curve, but but in previous days. I have to make these six calibration points myself using, you know, six volumetric flasks, and I have to also add internal standard to all of them and then run them. But with the prep fast, you have to only make one stock solution of 1,000 ppb, and then you put the, the dilution factors, you know, from 10 to 500. You know, for example, for 500, it'll be two dilution factor, and for 10, it'll be 100 dilution factor. So you just put those dilution factors, and it'll automatically run 
the, the curve for you. So that is why this is very, very helpful. So with this in hand, we started to develop our methodology to detect the metals in bioreactor. So we developed three different methods as shown over here, depending on the range of the metal. And we, we named them as bulk, minor, and trace metals. So the bulk was ranging from uh, 10 to 500 ppb, and it consisted of calcium, copper, iron, and magnesium. And the minor metals were chromium, manganese, and zinc, ranging from 5 to 100 ppb. And the trace metals were cobalt, lithium, molybdenum, and nickel. And they ranged from 0 0.05 to 5 ppb. As you can see, for each of the three methods, you have to only make one stock solution. For example, for bulk, we only need 1,000 ppb, and you just put these different dilution factors, and then it'll run the curve automatically. Similarly, for minor, we have to make 600 ppb, one stock solution, and then just put the dilution factors, and then it'll automatically generate. Similarly, for the trace metals. So with this methodology in place and, with, and the prep fast help, we wanted to screen the chemi the, the first place to start for this project was to screen the, the commonly used chemically defined media in the you know choose cell protein uh, culture production. So we choose these six um, uh, media: Opticho, Powercho, Procho, Excel 325, CDM4Cho, and Forticho, as shown over here. And we use the, these three methods to screen for the metal. And as you can see. There is a lot of variability of the metal content among different cultural media, but when you contact the vendor and when you look up their COAs, they'll not tell anything about the metals because it is proprietary information. So we were very surprised by these by the heterogeneity of the metal content. And as you can zoom in more, as you can see, like uh, for uh, obviously we saw the iron content is obviously a lot of variable and so is also copper and zinc. So yeah, we were very very surprised and then and then that is the reason why we started this research. We want to study uh, what is going on with the metals. So with this, I will summarize my part of my uh, of, of the methodology and then I will hand over to Dr. Madhav Rao. So basically, we use the prep fast, which we saw it auto calibrates and also. For the unknowns, it will dilute the sample into the range of my calibration curve. So it is very, very helpful. And obviously, I need only around 200 microliter. Uh, so right now, I need only one ml after dilution of my sample. And obviously, it is greener because we need less nitric acid. And with this in hand, we were able to you know, develop the methodologies for the metal uh, screening ranging from 1 to 2 micron to 100 micron to even millimolar range. And the breakfast was very, very helpful. With this, I would now switch it over to Dr. Madhav Rao. Madhav, all yours. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Adil, and thank you, Robert. Thus far, we have heard the merits of uh, the ICPMF for determining the metal content and the concentration in cell culture media. But although you have already heard from previous speaker on the importance of metals in cell culture, I would like to emphasize the need for quantification of metals in cell culture media. As you know, there are product stability issues due to metal catalyzed oxidation of amino acid residues of the therapeutic proteins. Iron, zinc, copper, and manganese ions are cofactors in metalloenzymes and metalloproteins within the mitochondria. Therefore, they influence the oxidative phosphorylation and the energy production within the cells. Many cytosolic enzymes need iron and iron sulfur, zinc and molybdenum as cofactors. Many glycosyl transferases utilize divalent metal ion cofactors, such as manganese and magnesium. For example, X-ray crystallographic analysis shows that the metal ion is coordinated to an oxygen of each of the two phosphate groups of the diphosphonucleosides and to the side chain of the carboxylate of an acidic amino acid residue in the glycosyl transferase. Therefore, we investigated the role of metals in hybrid cell cultures that produced a monoclonal antibody. Here I show the ribbon cartoon diagrams of a monoclonal antibody. On the left is the ribbon diagram of the monoclonal antibody, and the right is the space filling model. As you can see, it is a large protein made up of two 
light chains 20 kilo, 25 kilodaltons and two heavy chains of 50 kilodalton polypeptides. On top of it, the, at the hinge region, the a hinge region of the heavy chain, the monoclonal antibody provides two domains. One is called fragment antigen binding domain, and another one is the that is FAB, and another one is the fra fra fragment crystallizable. It's called our FC domain. The FC domain also is characterized by carbohydrate moieties attached at the 297th amino acid residue, which is an asparagine. Therefore, it is N-linked glycan. And the glycan itself can be complex. Not only these glycan structures are complex and influence the monoclonal antibody functions, but also their type and content varies due to variation in uh, production processes. Therefore, we wanted to assess the impact of metal concentration variation in the cell culture medium using three parallel bioreactors that we designate as process unit two, process unit three, and process unit four. We deliberately spiked the culture medium of process unit two with copper and iron 80 hours after inoculation. The increase in copper and iron in the cell culture medium samples of process unit two were clearly detected by ICPMS as compared with the uh, non-spiked process unit three and process unit four. All of the process parameters were comparable among the three process units, including the monoclonal antibody tire profiles. Therefore, we investigated the impact on the glycosylation. We quantified the glycans by mass spectrometry from the samples drawn at different time points during the campaign. What is shown here is the covariance of the four glycan types with time in panel A, and the relative abundance of the glycans containing one or two terminal galactose residues, they are called, called as complex type glycans in panel B. The take home message here is that only process unit two shows unacceptably higher variability and the complex type glycans relative abundance was inferior to process unit three. Both process unit three, uh, two and three got a cocktail of amino acids, but process unit two was also spiked with, uh, spiked with the copper and iron. To summarize, the process unit two and three received a cocktail of amino acids, non-essential amino acids, and process unit two, process unit four served as a control. Only process unit three showed a favorable effect on glycosylation in terms of keeping the low covariance as well as increasing the terminal galactose containing glycans. And the glycosylation homogeneity is affected when you actually spike with uh, iron or copper. Next, we investigated the impact of metal concentration on an enzyme replacement therapy class of molecule, and these are generally used to treat lysosomal storage diseases. Beta-glucuronidase is a good example because it is a lysosomal enzyme protein, and it is a glycosylated protein, as well as it is an approved molecule for treating um, SLY syndrome or MPS7. And, uh, for its effective function, this enzyme has to be phosphorylated on the mannose residue of the glycan, or it has to process M6P so that it can actually bind to M6P receptor and reach the cells in the liver and other tissues where it can uh, clear the accumulated um, uh, glycosaminoglycans, or GAGs. In our investigation, first we verified zinc and copper at 50 micromolar concentration along with 50 micromolar EDTA, wherein we wanted to create an artificial metal, metal ion concentration deficiency, along with a control in a set of eight parallel bioreactors, wherein each treatment received two bioreactors. In a six-day run, we found that only zinc treatment was positively effective in terms of increasing the, keeping the viability high as well as increasing the viable cell counts as you can see.
Then we investigated in depth zinc concentration effect in a range of 0 to 150 micromolar, zero being the untreated control. Zinc treatment was superior to control in terms of viability, but growth showed somewhat biphasic effect with better growth effects achieved at 50 and 100 micromolar concentration. Quantification of zinc in the bioreactor samples by ACPMS showed that zinc levels showed a comparable reduction at all levels of treatment, that is the slope being comparable, but in untreated control, the depletion was rapid and approached close to zero, as you can see on the panel on the right. The consequence of zinc treatment was investigated um, on the beta-glucuronidase production and its specific activity. Higher production was seen at 50 and 100 micromolar zinc treatment than either at control or at 150 micromolar treatment. The specific activity of the enzyme was also higher at 50 and 100 micromolar zinc treated uh, samples than in control or 150 micromolar treated samples. As you can see by SDS page analysis, the control sample showed higher contamination of the host cell proteins compared to zinc treated samples. Taken together, the data indicated that the cell death was minimized due to zinc treatment. We measured caspase 3 activity since it correlates with the apoptosis. The caspase 3 activity showed a suppression due to zinc treatment, indicating zinc possibly decreased apoptotic death of CHO cells. We also noticed that the iron and zinc were inversely correlated in the sense that the iron concentration, um, uh, sorry, this is the superoxide dismutase. The peroxidase activity was higher in the untreated controls, whereas in zinc treated it was less, as well, whereas superoxide dismutase activities were higher in zinc treated samples compared to the control. Therefore, oxidative, phosphor, uh, oxidative stress defense mechanisms are also affected by zinc concentration. The fucosylation content was kept low due to zinc treatment um, compared to the control. As you can see, the fucosylation actually is negatively correlated with the uh, uh, CDCC. Therefore, keeping this fucosylation concentration low is beneficial. Zinc treatment favored this. Whereas the mano 6 phosphate content, which is a critical quality attribute of the beta gluconoidase, was unaffected by zinc treatment. To summarize, cell cycle analysis revealed an inhibition of the sub G0 and G1 species in zinc supplemented cultures and that maintained the higher specific, higher viability. Higher specific activity of beta glucuronidase was seen at the harvest in zinc treated samples. Cell cycle analysis and the caspase 3 analysis showed that the Zinc acted, acted as a apoptosis inhibitor, and it did not have any impact. Zinc treatment did not have any impact on mano 6 phosphate content. 150 micromolar zinc treatment showed a relatively impaired growth, cell growth, and lowered the gas production. Therefore, a workable range appeared to be between 20 and 100 micromolar for the cell line we have used. Zinc deficiency affects cellular metal uptake and cell physiology in terms of altered oxidative, oxidative stress defense mechanism. Therefore, we can state that trace metal variation in mammalian cell culture media appears to be a critical process parameter that needs to be monitored. Uh, I would like to end with some acknowledgement because these are the people who helped us uh, in, in, in one way or the other to make the work that I have presented here uh, possible. And with that, I also I thank the organizers for this webinar and the audience. And with this, I will hand it over to the moderator again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mara Rivaro. Okay, so before we get started with your questions, which you can go ahead and start typing in at any time, we do have another um, question for you. So as a follow-up to this webinar, would you like to speak with an expert to discuss your application? So you can go ahead and answer that. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with the Q&A. So the first question is um, for 
a deal. From the metal concentration determination perspective, did you have to develop different methods for different cell culture medium or just vary the dilution factor in the procedure? So, yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, I think it's a great question, but usually, as you saw in my presentation, our ranges for the analytical method was, you know, like, for example, 10 to, 100, 10 to 500. So we have a wide range. So mostly I would just change my dilution factor. I have not, I have, I have seen so many culture media, but I have not changed the method. I mean, I think what we've developed so far, three methods, they cover almost, you know, all the metals, unless you come up with, uh, unless the metal is changed, then obviously you have to make a new method. But if the metal is same, I just change the dilution factor. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and Madhav, besides cell culture medium and the feed supplements, did you consider any other source that may have add to the variation in metal concentration and affect product quality? Yeah, this is another you know important question which uh, leaves us to open to so many things because uh, as you can see in bioprocessing, cell culture is a very complex uh, process. Various factors contribute to the to the to the cell culture overall performance of the cells uh, in the bioreactor. So we had considered also in addition to these these uh, uh, different cell culture media perhaps having different compositions because you do not have the proprietary data on each and every component of the cell culture medium. Uh, there is a possibility of bioreactor apparatus itself because you will have the metal Iron, uh, stainless steel, uh, you know, components going inside the the bioreactor. So they may be, ha contribute to some extent uh, over the course of 10 or 15 days bioreactor run. So that's one aspect we have considered, and then we did uh, compare that with a, a batch alone uh, runs compared to a fed batch. So. In a in a in a container, the 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 the, the containers being made up of plastic versus the glass and containing the metal ash, um, components versus that those which do not have like that we have considered some and in future we are also having some um, uh, interest in investigating single use bioreactors wherein the most of the components are going to be plastic or plastic based uh, different uh, compositions so that do they do they contribute anything uh, towards either metal or metal chelation which whether it happens those aspects are there in our radar okay and when making standards with the prep fast did you need to do any matrix matching or just rely on the internal standards yeah so yeah it's a good question so uh, i have been we have because it's a mass spec so i have been using the internal standard and what i have noticed that if uh, my sample is again that depends on the sample if it is too concentrated then i see a lot of shift in my internal standard so i think uh, at least plus minus 20 percent is allowed so i was always in that range so i dilute accordingly so that the internal standard does not vary too much, but I have been only using the internal standard, and I also tried uh, the spike recovery, you know, so that also works. So I, th I think, yeah, that's the way we have done it, yeah. Okay, and what is the lowest dilution factor you could use and still have no matrix effect? Yeah, so I think it is tied to the first question. So the lowest one I have used is only 2x dilution, you know, uh, for some of my media samples. And with that, I mean, again, I have internal standards, so I can track and see what's going on, but that is my lowest one I have used, and I have seen no matrix effect, even at that low dilution factor also. And do you notice any matrix effect when samples of high salts were analyzed? Was the internal standard used to correct for this effect? Yeah, so I think um, it is clear from my presentation, internal standard is always there because it's continuously running through the prep fast so and i have not used uh, samples of very high salt so far uh, maybe madhav can uh, correct me i mean i don't know uh, he's the biologist he do the bioreactors so, but uh, i i believe still i have not used very high concentration of salts and 
and actually, actually in those ones, uh, I think I have to dilute a lot of them. I have to dilute a lot at least 100x, so I think it is okay. But I have been using always internal standard. Yes. This might be an, a question from Marav, and let's see what to add to that. Previous question? Yeah, I think, yeah, we, we, we tend to actually compare this uh, matrix effect uh, somewhat more thoroughly um, uh, by, you know, not only just comparing the metal con content um, in the medium alone, um, but in the cell culture medium, cell-free uh, medium, and also uh, with different stages and different processes and all those uh, variabilities we, can take, uh, take, we have taken into consideration. And the pr procedure with which we came up uh, appears to have least effect or uh, least interference in terms of the matrix that can be attributed to matrix. And also, we to, recently we have not yet published, I think uh, with uh, me and Adil, we are in the process of writing up a manuscript on that, that uh, even digestion we are comparing with respect to the digestion, it appears to be agree in agreement with uh, the, the, the procedure we have uh, developed to, to avoid the matrix effect. Okay, this might be another question for you, Dr. Marav. Um, does ICPMS lend itself to identification of metals in microbial process cultures, and what trace metals can cause inhibitory effects to yield in kinetics? You know, it is it is a pretty open-ended question uh, to answer, and we do not actually look into the microbial uh, cultures uh, since we are cultivating only mammalian cell culture. In fact, if there is a mi microbial uh, Culture happens in it. It's a contamination. It's a big issue. Um, so uh, definitely, I mean, you know, it's a pretty open-ended question because um, trace metals definitely they do. You know, there's as such they are trace metals. Their concentration has to be very low. So if you go increase the concentration of the trace metals in the in the culture medium, it can be toxic. As I have shown, just by zinc. Zinc is, what we noticed is that it is deficient in some of the common chemically defined media. So when we supplemented that, we its positive effect in terms of the growth and productive productivity uh, for the cell lines, CHO cell lines especially. And you increase the concentration a little bit higher, it has got a negative effect. So I'm sure that that is uh, it's going to be the same for other trace metals. They would have a negative uh, influence on the, the culture. Uh, performance. Uh, I, I, think you, I cannot speak um, on individual metals by taking to, you know, as an example because we do not have an experience and nor do we actually uh, ourselves associate with microbial culture. Okay. And do we need to create a new method for each media? And if no, what should be the approach? So, yeah, I think I mentioned this before. So, I don't think so. You need to have a new method for each media. As far as you're only looking at the same metals, you know, whatever, uh, you know, which is in your method. But if you add a new metal, then you might have to make a new method, but you can just change the dilution factor and it should work. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, it looks like we're running low on time. Um, you can go ahead and type in your questions and we will be passing them on to our speakers for the answer um, directly in a follow-up email. But the last question actually is for uh, Robert. So what is the difference between triple, quadruple, and multi-quadruple ICP-MS? OK. Um, well, I think you have to understand that when manufacturers develop th these types of instrumentation, um, the critical component is the collision and reaction cell. And there's no question um, having a quadrupole in the collision and reaction cell allows you to select a band pass. The, the stability regions in a quadrupole are much better defined than a hexapole or an octopole. So you can actually control the band pass. So if there's any secondary reactions coming from the reaction gas and the matrix components or any impurities in the reaction gas, um, you have to be able to reject any interferences that could um, that could interfere with any other analytes. So it's critical that you have control over that bandpass. So you're sending um, 
the analyte ions through to the to the analyzer quadrupole free of any further interferences which are produced by secondary reactions. And that's the difference. A triple quadrupole system is not technically a triple quadrupole because the commercial um, the, the commercial instruments on the mark in the marketplace either use a hexapole or an octopole in the as a collision and reaction cell. So it's not technically a triple quadrupole system. But having a quadrupole in in the reaction in the reaction collision cell allows you to have much better control over the secondary reactions. And there's no question that are benefits for that because it allows you to basically pass the analyte ion through to the analyzer quadrupole without fear of any interfering ions coming from secondary reactions. Okay, well, thank you, Robert and uh, Dr. Mohammed and Dr. Madvaro. And thank you to the audience for joining us. The recorded version of this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website. And as a registered attendee, you'll receive a follow-up email providing you with a direct link. We look forward to having you join us at Future Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. Look for those announcements in your inbox. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.